Okay, so what we want to uh, talk about now is that, well, basically what we have found is that the Laplace transform of the potential is given by this, and the dielectric constant that goes into there is this. The question is, what's phi in real space? I'm sorry, in real time, you know, as a time varying quantity. And I'll leave it as a function of k, so we'll just say that we're interested in how does phi vary in time for a particular um, mode, is the kind of idea, particular k mode. So what I would have to do to do that is I would have to take the inverse Laplace transform. So in particular, um, so let's uh, uh, try, let's call it this way, try to calculate um, phi tilde of k and t. And the way we would do that is phi tilde of k and t would be the inverse Laplace transform of what we just found, phi hat of k and omega. So all we have to do is we look at our expression for phi hat here, and uh, we imagine some way or other we'll calculate this, right? And uh, some way or other we'll take account of the dielectric constant, and we'll be able to do all that. Well, that turns out to be a non-trivial job, as you can kind of imagine. But, you know, what, what do we usually get out of such things? Well, if, if you go into Laplace transform theory, what you end up doing is you say, well, look, uh, that Laplace transform, inverse transform, is an integral along the contour of d omega over 2 pi e to the minus i omega t times phi hat of k and omega. And this Laplace transform, uh, if I look in complex omega space, here's omega real and omega imaginary, and then I have my Laplace contour along here. Um, so this is my Laplace contour. And of course, it's this distance sigma above. How would I calculate that? Well, it turns out, if you look at the signs of everything, um, what you need to do is to close it in the lower half plane. Okay. And how do you go about doing that? Sorry, let me... Yeah, right. Well, what you have to do is deform the contour downward. Okay. And as you deform it downward, what happens is it comes up. It might find that you can deform it to some extent, but there are perhaps some poles which come in, and you have to deform the contour so as not to go around those poles. So what you do is you analytically continue the contour downward. So let me do a downward. You move the contour downward. But every time you run into a pole in the phi hat, you deform the contour around that pole, and then you can finally close in the lower half plane. Okay. Now, uh, so roughly speaking, what you end up doing, uh, and then you get residues from each of those poles. Okay. So the net result of a Fourier of of a inverse Laplace transform is you get the sum over the roots, and let's call these omega j's, some particular roots, of some functional, which is, uh, I guess in this case, it'll be phi hat over 2 pi, evaluated at k and omega sub j, uh, e to the i omega j t. And then you get plus a residual contour, which is proportional to e to the minus gamma t, where gamma is the distance that you have brought this contour down. So how far you pull this contour down. Now, by the way, if you were doing this in, some people are used to e to the p, e to the minus pt, and e to the minus st, usual Laplace transform variables. 
you just take this diagram and you turn it up this way, and you have the real part of S and the imaginary part of S. But that's just a, an aside. So if you pull this contour down far enough, then this residual is small, and all you get are the roots that have to do with uh, zeros or poles that, or singularities of various types, poles, branch points, and so forth and so on. So the fundamental question then is um, where are the uh, poles or branch points, but poles turn out to be all you need to worry about for the most part, um, of phi hat of k and omega because those represent resonant responses of the system. Okay. So where are we going to get poles out of that function? Well, how about this stuff in the numerator? How about no? Turns out that stuff's okay. You can show that for reasonably well-behaved f tilde that this is an analytic function and it does not have any poles uh, any place in the plane, it turns out, for reasonable f tildes. So the only place you get poles are those positions where the dielectric constant vanishes. That is to say, where you've hit a normal mode of the system. Um, and it turns out it's where epsilon hat then of k and omega j, let's say, is equal to zero. So our problem reduces to finding the zeros of the dielectric constant, just like it did in fluid theory. It's just like, it's just that our um, particular dispersion relation is a little more complicated. So let's look at our dispersion relation and try to find its zeros. So we have epsilon hat of k and omega is epsilon naught times 1 minus omega pe squared over k squared integral minus infinity to infinity du df du divided by u minus omega over k. And again, I'll keep writing this down because we'll need it in a moment. I have to have that the imaginary part of omega is greater than sigma. Okay. So now we've got a little bit of a problem. Namely, on this analytic continuation of the contour that we want to perform the Laplace transform over, we want to deform that down into the lower half plane from the upper half plane. But effectively, our function here, the dielectric constant, is only defined up here, above the contour. So how do we analytically continue the function, namely this integral, down into the lower half plane? That is to say, analytically continue this definition, this function, down you know, below that. Well. Pragmatically, this is itself, in a different context now, this is itself a, a contour integral. It's just along minus infinity to infinity. But by imaginary omega greater than sigma, what that effectively means is that this point omega over k is above the line that's going to have the singularity on it. So what that means is that, we can make a little plot here, uh, again, in the complex plane, the function is originally defined with the point omega over k. So here's, now this is an analytic function of a complex variable u. So this is u real and u imaginary. These are now imaginary and real velocities. But you shouldn't let that bother you because really it's just a mathematical uh, concept, okay? It's not a, uh, you don't care whether that's a real physical situation. And there's a pole up here, and the pole is at omega over k, and I put it in the upper plane because our function is only defined for imaginary omega greater than sigma. Okay? And so this contour, which is from minus infinity to infinity right along the real axis, goes then below that singularity. Now what I want to do is I want to analytically continue the function downward. I want to analytically continue this integral such, and I want to find out what that integral does as omega goes downward. 
Well, it turns out you can show that the analytic procedure is that you just let it go downward and you just deform the contour so that that point omega over k never gets on the other side of the contour. Okay. So let's, this is for the case, the first one for, is for the case imaginary omega greater than zero. It's a little hard to see that way. Imaginary omega equals zero. What you do is you say, well, hmm, it's uh, right on the contour, okay? Now what do I do? Well, the procedure, the analytic procedure is you take the contour right up to the point, and then you say, but i got to go around the point this way, okay? And then I can further ask what happens if... I analytically continue this integral down to the position where imaginary omega is less than zero. Okay? So he's in the lower half plane. But the analytic continuation procedure says make the contour always go below the singularity of the integral. Okay? So this is, let me label these a bit. This is ui, u real. U I U real. So that's the prescription. Now, so what? What does this cause? Well, to see what this causes us to do in the mathematics, we have to re remember what I hope most of you have seen in some other regards, namely mathematical regards uh, of complex variables. Uh, namely the so-called Cauchy Integral Theorem. The Cauchy Integral Theorem says that if I have the integral of some analytic function of a complex variable, f of z, divided by z minus a, then this is just equal to the function evaluated at the singularity point, at the pole, basically, z equals a, but times something, which is zero. Well, okay, now we have to draw a little. Here's our Cauchy integral contour. And the question is, is the point inside, on, or outside? So this is inside, on the contour, or outside. The answer is that if the point A, sorry, this is the point A, if the point A is outside, then we get, there's no pole inside the contour, so we get um, zero. If it's outside, the traditional, I'm sorry, if it's inside, people always know that the answer is it's 2 pi i, f of A. And it turns out the trickiness is that if it's on the contour, it's actually pi i, and people don't usually talk about that. But what it amounts to is, if you remember how this calculation is done, you shrink the contour down around this, and you just integrate around that. Uh, or you just you, you shrink the contour down until it's only around the pole, and the comment is that when you're on, you, you shrink only it's a half contour you shrink down. So you only go pi i instead of 2 pi i to get around it. Very important pi, it turns out. Okay. So with that in mind, um, this says, this tells us then what to do about these various pieces here. Namely, it says that this, con that this integral here, the integral from minus infinity uh, to infinity du, f prime of u divided by u minus omega over k is equal to, now, in the case where we have um, imaginary omega greater than zero, it'll just be the standard integral which we had, du f prime of u divided by u minus omega over k for imaginary omega greater than zero. On the other hand, where it goes through here, Using the Cauchy integral theorem, we'll just pick up a pi i at that residue. And so this will give us a minus infinity to infinity du 
f prime of u divided by u minus omega over k, and then plus the residue, pi i, and then it'll be just df du evaluated at the resonance point, which is u is equal to omega over k, or the singularity point. Now, there is still this problem of what about that integral, and it turns out the residual integral I need to do is now the principal value integral that we talked about before. What about this one? So this is, you know, three definitions here. Okay, I'm, well. Um, when I have imaginary omega less than zero, you know, the, the singularity has moved into the lower half plane then I can still, the straight integral is OK du f prime of u over u minus omega over k. But now it's, you know, it's more or less just this straight integral, but then I have to take account of the fact that it's also this little loop around here. And so that's actually plus... 2 pi i df du evaluated at u equals omega over k. So the point is that this singular integral has its proper definition only when omega is in the way into the upper half plane. And we have to analytically continue this singular integral as we move the point, as we move omega down as we analytically continue this dielectric function constant, dielectric constant function down for waves which are nearly not damped at all and then waves which are damped. should have said, of course, this is the position x omega over k as well, but uh, anyway. So that's the way we end up defining uh, this basic integral here that we need to uh, deal with. So um, now we're going to anticipate in the final part of this business that uh, we're interested only in very weakly damped cases. So let's now evaluate um, epsilon hat of k and omega using these prescriptions now uh, for... Uh, what's called a cold plasma limit or fluid limit, namely where omega over K is much greater than V thermal, which is square root of temperature. What we anticipate is that we will find that omega is approximately equal to plus or minus omega PE. That's what we would like to see. So let's, uh, since it's going to be nearly real, we will use the imaginary omega equals zero formula. And epsilon hat of k and omega. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I meant wanted to mention one thing. Is this function really, or I mean, you look at this and you say, my gosh, if the poles, if the zero, well, the pole of the integrand is in the upper half plane, it has one definition, then it has another one here and a different one there. Is that a continuous function? Looks jumpy, right? But it isn't. Because when I have imaginary omega in here, but I'm a little bit above, you can show that, in fact, in the limit that the imaginary omega goes to zero, this function goes over to that one and then goes into the lower half plane It does this. Because remember here, omega is real, but here omega is imaginary. So this function, this is actually the definition which does provide a continuous definition. So we have epsilon hat over epsilon naught is equal to then 1 minus omega PE squared over K squared integral minus infinity to infinity du uh, df du all divided by U minus omega over K. Now by our definition of imaginary omega approximately equal to zero, or well, this was defined as imaginary omega greater than zero, we're going to set this equal to, for imaginary omega approximately equal to zero, 
be 1 minus omega pe squared over k squared. And then the integral from minus infinity to infinity du df du divided by u minus omega over k. But now we have to do the principal value integral there. And then we have plus pi i df du at u equals omega over k. Okay, and that's, uh, we'll have to stop here, it looks like, as of time. And this is then the dielectric constant, which we will want to work out in some greater detail, and in particular, um, work it out uh, when, you know, when we're trying to get plasma oscillations. What we will do is say the phase velocity, omega over k, is much greater than the typical thermal velocity, so we'll make an expansion within this, and then we'll only be left with this residue term, imaginary residue term. Imaginary part means growth or damping, and this is actually going to be the source of Landau damping in a plasma. And we'll quit there. For